بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم By the grace of Allah عز وجل we come together today to discuss the hadith uh, popular hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم the hadith being the hadith that most of you may already know, hadith of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he said that he heard the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam saying, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, all actions are based on their intentions. And uh, this hadith has, you know, a lot of unique aspects of it that can be discussed. They can be discussed in very much detail. They can be discussed over... A course 10 days long, 15 days long, whatever, however long you get, you know, this hadith can be discussed during that time period. However, we'll try to keep it concise and we'll discuss the hadith in two days. Maximum three days, inshallah ta'ala. Now, today, what we want to do is particularly discuss uh, things or highlights pertinent to the sahabi that had narrated this hadith. And that is Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, uh, this hadith is interesting in that it is a hadith that is known as a gharib hadith. And Imam al-Bayquni, or uh, al-Bayquni, uh, عليه, he, you know, explains a gharib hadith to mean وَقُلْ غَرِيبٌ مَا رَوَى رَوَىٰ فَقَطْ Say that a gharib hadith, okay, so basically he's saying the definition of a gharib hadith, um, and we were studying ulum al-hadith previously, is that it's only narrated by one person. It's only narrated by one person. So if anywhere during the chain, you have only one person in that level of the chain. So for example, you have from amongst the tabi'een, uh, only one person narrating this hadith. But after the tabi'een, there's like several people that took from one tabi'een. Sa'id ibn Musayyid. There was like 50 people that took from him. Sa'id was just by himself. This hadith would be considered what? A gharib hadith, because there was only one person narrating, be it even in one level. Now the interesting thing about this hadith is that it's not just in one level, it's in you know, um, three different levels after the sahabi, where there is only one person narrating. After that, there is numerous narrations of the hadith. So you have Yahya, Ibn Sa'id al-Ansari. Who's a tabi'i? You have Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al-Taymi. Who's also a tabi'i? And you have Al-Qama ibn Waqqas al-Layfi. Who's also a tabi'i. They're all narrating from each other. They're tabi'is. And they're all... Uh, uh, they're, sorry, they're all in... Uh, they're all by themselves. Pardon me about the tabi'i there. They're all... Uh, narrating from each other, and in that level, they're all single. They're all single. Okay? And then Umar ibn Khattab is also the only Sahabi that had narrated this hadith. So this hadith is considered ghalib. Now what happens is, a lot of the, uh, the, you know, uh, the Orientalists, they look at this a hadith like this, and they'll say that, you know, you have, you're saying that uh, the hadith is ghalib. So they'll try to equate, and they'll try to confuse people, and they'll try to um, put doubts into the sunnah by saying that this hadith is gharif, gharib, i.e. it's what? It's life. They'll try to say, you know, you guys have Sahih al-Bukhari, who put this hadith as the very first hadith in the whole text. And it's life? How so? But that's not the point. That's not the case. A gharib hadith, though it's only one narrator, it doesn't mean that it's life. If it's just one narrator, and that narrator is a very strong narrator, khalas, for us it's fine, not a problem. It's, is it a problem? It's not a problem. It's not a problem at all. So, you have... Uh, Imam al-Bukhari putting this as the first hadith in his text. 
Now, there's another point here. A gharib hadith, we said it's not life, sahih? It's not life. Is it, does it show you that a hundred percent the Prophet ﷺ said it? Or does it show you 50% the Prophet ﷺ said it? Or above 50% and we say we'll accept it? Essentially, any hadith that is, hasn't reached the level of tawatu, where the hadith becomes a recurring narration. Essentially, any hadith that is of such quality, it doesn't show us that the hadith is 100%. It doesn't show us that. Why? Why? Because if it's not recurringly narrated, okay? If it's not recurringly narrated, then you have to go search the chain. And you have to look through the chain and see if every single person is okay. When you do find out, at that point, you can rest assured that this hadith is authentic. But right away, the mere fact that it was transmitted to us, does it become right away 100%? The answer is no. However, a mutawatir hadith, like the ahadith that speak about the hawd of Rasulullah wasallam, like the ahadith that speak about shafa'ah, like the ahadith that speak about um, where, where the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلِتَبَوَّ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever lies upon me, and he is doing it pur- uh, purposely, you know, intentfully, he's doing it, uh, and he knows that he's lying, then let him take a seat for himself in hellfire. Now this hadith is recurring, there's over 70 different narrations of this hadith. So over here, because there's so many different narrations, one guy told you, another guy told you, a third guy told you, what happens? Right away, the mere fact that you hear it from so many different sources, you don't have to verify anymore. However, there is one thing that needs to be noted. That when you find a hadith in Bukhari, some of the ulama, they said, even if it is not a recurring narration, it becomes from that 100% right away. Because who's the person... Who in the world actually looks at the chain of Bukhari and says, Oh, is this guy okay? Is this guy not? We all just pick up Bukhari, literally, like the Qur'an, we start reading and we say, this is all sahih. So, and, and, so the ulama, they said, based on the recurring research, and, and, the, and, the, and the different times, and different ulama, and different countries, that looked at the text and checked it thoroughly, we now recognize that, the Bukha, that any hadith found in Bukhari, it gives us absolute certainty that the Prophet ﷺ had said it. So even if this Orientalist does come to you and he says it's a hadith, you know, he tries to give you a little bit of a doubt, rest assured because the whole ummah has a creed upon the fact that the hadith, that a hadith when it's found in Bukhari, what happens? It's right away authentic, without any reason to check. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu he was um, his kunya was Abu Hafs and he was the father-in-law of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam as Hafsa was married to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam and uh, Umar al-Khattab he brought his uh, daughter Hafsa to Abu Bakr to you know get her married to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr just stayed quiet so Umar al-Khattab was really disheartened and saddened from the fact that um, even Abu Bakr didn't even reply to Umar ibn Khattab. Now, what, the reasoning behind that was, Abu Bakr knew that possibly the Prophet ﷺ is considering getting married to Hafsa. So then the Prophet, then uh, basically then Hafsa and the Prophet, uh, uh, Prophet ﷺ, they got married. So then Umar came to uh, Abu Bakr, he said that, I didn't want to tell the secret of the Prophet ﷺ to you. That's the reason why I stayed quiet. I didn't want to say no, I didn't want to say yes, but because he was considering it, I would stay quiet at that point. And I didn't want to tell you the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. Later on in the life of the Prophet, uh, Prophet ﷺ either decided to divorce Hafsa, or he actually physically did once. It's one or the other. Okay? Based on the different narrations. In either case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from above the seven heavens, He commanded the Prophet ﷺ to what? To go back, if he had divorced her, then take her back as a wife. Because you know, the first divorce, uh, she still remains your wife. Or if he hasn't divorced her, then don't consider the divorce. Because why? 
irda'an li Umar. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will please um Umar through this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even had a very great standard or status in, 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 his, in his sight for Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu where he sends down wahi to the Prophet sallallahu and com- commands him to keep his daughter as a wife. Now, what happened, um, as most of you already know the story of Umar al-Khattab and how he accepted Islam, um, Umar ibn al-Khattab was walking one day, and he had a sword in his hand. So a man from Bani, Banu Zuhra, he saw Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an. So he stopped him, he said, إِلَىٰ أَيْنَ تَعْمِدُوا يَا عُمَرْ Where are you trying to go to, Umar? So... Umar ibn Khattab, he said, I am going to kill Muhammad. I'm going to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Now, he said, if you kill Muhammad, how are you going to go and save yourself from Banu Hashim and the tribalism and all of that that occurs? They're going to have to, you know, somehow, they're going to take revenge for this blood that you are going to spill from their tribe. So Umar ibn Khattab, he said to this man from Banu Zuhra, he said, it seems as if you have also become a Muslim and you've left the deen of our forefathers. So now this man, he was afraid of course at this point. Umar ibn Khattab is the man, he takes out his sword at any moment and you know he's ready to... Now, now what we'll talk about you know, Umar al-Khattab taking out his sword and get, getting ready to fight. And how that didn't affect the justice that Umar ibn al-Khattab had placed in the Islamic law when he came and became the Khalifa. A lot of people think, you know, because he was taking out his sword all the time, you know, he was not a just man. But when he came into Khilafah, the reality was he was amongst the most just of leaders that ever existed in the history of Islam. And we'll see a reasoning why. So anyways, Umar al-Khattab... He talked to this man. This man said, said to him, why don't you go deal with your sister and your brother-in-law? It seems that they have also become Muslims. So Umar al-Khattab right away, he went to his sister's house. And as he was in, you know, got close, he started hearing like a simmering sound from the house. And uh, there was a man there from amongst the Muslims um, at their house as well, teaching Umar ibn Khattab's sister and her husband, the Qur'an. And they had a piece of paper in their hands. So when he walked in, he said, what is going on here? What are you guys talking about? So we're just having a conversation, you know, nothing more. But uh, Umar said, what's that in your hand there? It was a piece of paper. Who knows what was on that piece of paper? Surah Taha. Exactly. Qur'an, yes, but uh, Surah Taha particularly. It was on that paper. Now Umar al-Khattab, he got angry and he started getting physical with the husband of his sister, as in her, his brother-in-law. And of course, when a woman sees such a thing, you know, out of her emotions, she can't hold herself. Although she, you know, she might get hurt in the middle, she tried to go protect her husband. And Umar al-Khattab, he then hit his sister. Because he was so angry and Quraysh had filled the hearts of these people and the minds of these people with filth, just as the media today fills the mind of people, minds of people with filth. And you know, all sorts of misinformation about Islam. So what did Umar say at that point? Then you know, when he saw his sister crying and he saw the blood and he saw all these things, he started to you know, get more and more, you know, um, he had that relation with his sister. So because of that brotherly love, he could not bear seeing that sight. So he said, let me see this that's in your hand. So they told him, no, you're, you have to make wudu. You have to go and take a shower. Because you're not a Muslim. So he did such. He made wudu, he took a shower, and then he took the piece of paper and he started reading. And he read, he read, he read, until he got to verse number 14. From... Surah Taha, which says, "Innani an Allah, la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqim al-salat al-dikr." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talking to Moses in the beginning of Surah Taha. He said, "Verily, I am the Lord 
with whom there is no partners. La ilaha illa huwa illa ana fa'budni. So that so worship me because of the fact that there is no deity, deity besides me. So Allah subhanahu wa taala is using this um, uh, the the unity and the fact that He is the only Lord. He's using this as a proof for Musa to worship worship Allah Azza wa Jalla alone. And to establish the prayer for the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Now when Umar al-Khattab, he heard this, he was an Arab and he could hear the balagha, the eloquence, the rhetoric in the voice and the speech. He got up right away, he said, tell me where Muhammad is. Now the man that was hiding from amongst the Muslims, he saw Umar ibn khattab that he seems that maybe he's interested in Islam, so he wasn't afraid anymore. You know, the same man that was teaching his brother and his, uh, his brother-in-law and his sister how to read the Qur'an. So he came out and he said he's in that house over there. So anyways, long story short, Umar ibn khattab finally got to that house and the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Allahumma a'izz al-Islama bi ahad al-Umarayn. Oh Allah, you know, um, give izzah, give might to Islam through one of the two Umars. Amr ibn Hisham and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. At that point he came and he met the Prophet sallallahu People were scared, you know, Umar al-Khattab with the sword, he's walking up, he's a big man, he's really tall, Umar al-Khattab. And uh, he walked to the door, so all of the Sahaba are scared. Now Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu he was also a brave and strong man. So when he saw Umar, he was the one who was like, you know, not a problem guys, don't worry, I got it covered. <laughs> so if something happens, he said, if Allah wishes good for Umar, he's gonna guide him. If he doesn't, I'll take care of it. <laughs> so, you know, this was how they were back in the days. And finally, Umar al-Khattab, he accepted Islam. And you see the beauty of this man, and the fact that even Allah Azza wa Jal and the people from above the heavens, they, used, they, they, they were happy for the fact that he'd accepted Islam. Jibreel came to the Prophet Ali wasalam, he said, لَقَدْ اسْتَسَرَّ أَهْلُ السَّمَاءِ بِإِسْلَامِ That the people, the committee in the heavens are really proud of the fact that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu has accepted Islam. So this was not a joke, and that's why, you know, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, and he used to say that, you know, that كَانَ إِسْلَامُ عُمَرْ فَتْحًا That the fact that Umar ibn Khattab had accepted Islam was an opening. Was a door that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had opened. It's a victory. So they felt victorious from that point onwards. And to an extent that Umar ibn Khattab was... Maybe uh, was the first one to go openly and do the rites of Islam in public. You know, right after he became a Muslim, he went to the house of uh, Abu Jahl. And he knocked on his door, he said, you know, I've become a... Right when he knocked on his door, he said, Marhaban bi Umar. He said, you know, welcome, O oh Umar. So he said, uh, uh, he said that, uh, he said, I have become a Muslim. And I, he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu an Muhammad al-Rasul. So Abu Jahl came and smashed the door in Umar's face. And he said that, uh, he said, Qabbahak uh, Allah, Qabbahak Allah, wa Qabbah Allah, He said, you know, may Allah distort your image, and also that which you brought with you. So, you know, he wasn't happy of course, but he can't do anything. If it was like a, like a slave boy, from amongst the slave boys of, you know, of Quraysh, you think Abu Jahl would have left him at the door? No, but this is Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. To an extent that he got to the Kaaba, he started making tawaf, and he, he promised the Prophet that I'm going to go and tell every single person that I'm a Muslim now. So he went to the Kaaba and he started saying, Ashadu la ilaha illallah loud, and he's making tawaf and he was doing the rites of Islam. And then, of course, the mushriks, the mushrikeen as a group, were, thought they could overpower Umar as a group. So they came and they all jumped Umar to fight Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. So Umar ibn Khattab, he jumped on top of one of them, and he took his fingers and he poked the guy's eyes. <laughs> of course, this is, you know, think about the fact that the whole, whole, like the whole society is now fighting you. You have to do something to try to get out of your problem now. He picked a fight. Huh? He picked a fight. He picked a fight. 
But he picked a very rightful fight. You know, he promised the Prophet ﷺ that he's gonna go pick this fight. And he was able to win the fight. He, then, then basically from that point onwards, there was no one that, uh, that, that came to Umar again because they didn't want their eyes poked out, you know. <laughs> so, um, so then Umar continued, they came back to the Prophet ﷺ and said, okay, the job's done, you know, the gig's done. I went and told everybody that I'm a Muslim and we have no problems. And even at that point, some of the, some of the Sahaba were still afraid. So, what uh, Umar ibn Khattab, Hamza, you know, they're both the tough guys, what they did was they became like the bodyguards of the Prophet ﷺ. So one is behind him, one is in front of him, and they're walking like, you know, uh, to the Haram, to, the, to Mecca, and they finally got to Mecca, and the Prophet ﷺ at that point, you know, he prayed openly, Salat al in front of people. And nobody could do anything because Hamza was there, who was a warrior, and Umar al-Khattab was there, who was poking people's eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Umar al-Khattab, he also, after he became a Muslim, later on finally, um, long story short, because the time is short, uh, people, um, Abu Bakr, he wrote, before he was dying, he wrote a letter, uh, he brought Uthman, he told them to come and write a letter, and he wrote a letter in which he actually told the people to have Umar ibn Khattab as the Khalifa after him. So Uthman hid this paper, and when Abu Bakr died, he brought this paper out and he said, this is the, you know, this is the scroll from Abu Bakr, and he told me to tell you guys this, and whoever is in this little envelope right here is going to be the Khalifa next. So everybody, the whole Ummah agreed, including Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, as opposed to what the Shia say, um, they all agreed, vocalized, Ali particularly vocalized his agreement to the fact that Umar ibn Khattab will be the Khalifa. Uh, and then he took out the paper, and Umar Khattab, this, how, this is how Umar Khattab basically became the Khalifa, with the command of Abu Bakr before him. And after he became the Khalifa, now we were talking about the Adl, we're talking about the justice, and the just nature of Umar ibn Khattab as a Khalifa. Now, check this out. Umar ibn Khattab had a number of what they call karamat. There is something called al-mu'jizat. Mu'jizat are what? So specific to the, they're miracles, but they're specific to the Prophet. Karamat are also translated in English as miracles. But in Arabic, there is a difference between the two, in terms of the wording. So, karamat happen to pious people, and they occur, and it's from the aqidah of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, to believe that there is uh, particular miracles that sometimes occur on the hands, by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal, on the hands of some pious people, and some ulama, and such, so on and so forth. And there's several narrations from the ulama over the generations of you know certain incidents that occurred in their lives, that it would be considered karamat. Until this day we find, we find cases here and there. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he had the water, the water listened to him when he commanded the water. How so? Two incidents. One of them is River Nile. I'm only going to mention that shortage of time, because that's the more popular, and that's the longer story. So, Basically what happened was, from the time of Fir'aun, all the way till the time of Umar ibn Khattab, they, every single year there would be a shortage of water in the river, river Nile. So what they would take do is they would have a virgin girl, they would dress her up like she is a bride. They would put all sorts of jewelry on her. Crazy folks. They would, you know, dress her up as if she's just about to go meet her husband, the, the groom, for the first time. And then they would pick this beautiful woman up and throw her in the, <laughs> in the river. <laughs> Why? Because they thought that they had to please the river Nile for them to have what? Water every single year. The water level wouldn't go up until they would throw the water in, uh, th throw um, the girl in to the water. So Amr ibn As, now he just became like the governor for Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala in this neighborhood now, 
in Misr, in Egypt. Now, when this came, when the, that time of the year came, they came to Amr ibn al-As and said, you know, we've been doing this for centuries. We know how our things work in this country. You know, we have to have this lady, you know, we have to throw her the water, otherwise we're not going to have water for the rest of the year. You get the point or not, we're going to have to do it, because otherwise we're not going to have water. So, Amr ibn al-As, he was like really confused, like, you know, he was uh, shocked. He's like, what are you, what's wrong with you guys, you know? We used to bury them, you guys throw them in the river, you know? <laughs> so, um, so now, Amr ibn As, he said, I'm not going to do anything until I go and ask the permission of Umar al-Khattab. Or ask Umar al-Khattab in general for advice. Umar ibn al-Khattab wrote to Amr, and he wrote a little piece of paper in which he wrote, from Abdul, from the slave of Allah. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said, addressing the Nile, he said, if you flow because of your own self, like if you are the one flowing by yourself without any outside uh, interference or intervention, then don't flow because we don't need you. You know, we don't need you. We only need Allah. And if it is Allah al-Wahid al-Qahar, the all-capable, the all-powerful, if it's He's the one that's making you flow, then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep you flowing. And he said to Amr ibn As, he said, take this piece of paper and throw it in the Nile. So when Amr ibn As, he threw this piece of paper in the Nile, the next morning, the water had increased 16 feet. And they had no reason, they had no need for you know, this uh, ritual of throwing a beautiful girl into the river. And... Um, and, and, for, and that was one incident where the water itself listened to the command of Umar ibn Khattab. Another incident where another part of the earth actually listened to the command of Umar ibn Khattab was the incident where the, in his time in Medina, there, start, there was a, there was a, a zilzal, a um, earthquake. There was an earthquake. And uh, the earth, when it was shaking, Umar ibn Khattab, he took his uh, salt, his, uh, his, his whip. He took his whip, and he whipped the floor. And he said, he said, أَتَزَلْزَلِينَ وَأَنَا أَعْدِلُ عَلَيْكَ Do you go through an earthquake whilst I am being justful on the land? While I am being just on the land. So he used the fact that he was the most, one of the most just of people, just of leaders, to tell the earth to stop shaking. And from that point onward, there was never an earthquake in the time of Umar al And it stopped at that, in the same moment, it stopped. And from that point onwards, and Ibn Subki rahmatullah alayhi mentioned this in detail, that from that point onwards, during the lifetime of Umar ibn Khattab, there was no more earthquakes. Or at least, you know, to say the least, at least not where he was. You know, because the earth was scared of Umar. No, I don't know if he was scared, but you know. And from this, the ulama, they derived that one of the reasons for earthquakes is when the leading people in the society are no, no longer just. So when they stop being just, because Umar al-Khattab is saying, the reasoning why he gave to the earth to stop having the earthquake is because I'm being just, why? you don't have a reason to have an earthquake. Because earthquakes are usually you know, a result of uh, injustice in the land. So he said, I'm being just. Based on this, the ulama, they said, that if leaders are being just, you know, the chances are there won't be much earthquakes. Or one of the reasons for the earthquakes is the injustice in the land. Another virtue of this man, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was that from the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was considered, he was considered al-muhaddath. He was considered the individual that was, that was al-muhaddath. There was, there's, in most, in every nation there's a prophet, Nabi, 
And then there's a person that is called a muhaddaf and there's a Siddiq. We all know who's a Siddiq. Abu Bakr. Umar was al muhaddaf That means he had a certain type of intuition that would give him insight to things that other people wouldn't get insight to. Naturally, through intuition, through ilham from Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why you see several different occasions, Umar ibn Khattab had an opinion, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse, agreeing to the opinion of who? Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. And, you know, um, the, uh, finally, to cut things short, you know, Umar ibn Khattab, after he'd filled the land with justice, and after he'd lived a life of a khalifa for about 10 years, above 10 years, um, as a just Khalifa, it finally came time for him to pass away, as it is inevitable for every per- person to pass away. And how old was he when he passed away? According to Ibn al Mulaqin, Rahimahullah, who was amongst the explainers of uh, Bukhari, who was amongst the people who explained the Bukhari, to the best of the eight opinions on the issue, is that he passed away at the same age as the Prophet, 63. So he was 63 years old. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he passed away. How did he pass away? Umar ibn Khattab was praying salah. As he was praying salah, a man by the name of Abu Lu'lu, who was either a Majusi or he was a Nasran. He was either Christian or he was a Zoroastrian. He came, and the reason why he came to do this anyways, was because he came to Umar ibn Khattab, he was like a slave boy. He came to Umar ibn Khattab, he said, you know, my master takes too much money from me every single day from the work I do. Now, we know that the, in Islam, and even in Jahiliyyah before that, in Islam only came to wipe out uh, the whole concept of slavery. But slowly, and it occurred now, there's no more slavery in the world. Um, at that point, you know, uh, and it continues, if it ever comes back, the ruling will be there as well. Whatever is owned by the slave is actually the ownership of the master. And so, the slave Abu Lu'lu, he came to Umar Khattab, he said, he takes too much money from me, he gives me some, but he takes too much money from me, on a daily basis, from the work I do. So, tell him to take a little bit less. So Umar ibn Khattab, he said, fear Allah and obey your master. Now, when he said that, he got angry, the slave boy. And so, he prepared a dagger with two, uh, two sharp uh, edges to it. So that he, he, then he brought this dagger, and he took both the sharp edges of his dagger, and he put poison on them. He poisoned the dagger. The dagger itself is killer, but he poisoned the dagger. Then he came to Salah, while Umar al-Khattab is praying with all his khushur. And he came and he stabbed Umar ibn Khattab. And he stabbed a number of Sahaba. He started stabbing left, right, center. Because he stabbed, and now people are going to try to get him. So he's trying to run through the lanes, trying to get away from the Sahaba. So they, he started stabbing anyone that would come in his way. And finally, one Sahabi, he thought, he, you know, what to do? He took a cloak and he threw the cloak on top. Like a big cloak. He took it and he threw it on top of Abu Lu'lu so that he would stop. And now when this occurred, Abu Lu'lu knew what's gonna happen to him. Something really bad, of course he's killed so many people now, or potentially killed so many people now. So Abu Lu'lu then he took the, took the dagger and slit his own throat. He killed himself. Now, Umar ibn Khattab now is in this situation where he's just about to die. He's just about to die. And Imam al-Shu'bi, uh, Shu'bi, he mentions that Umar ibn Khattab, he mentions that he would, at that point, he was brought a bowl of milk, and he drank the milk, and the stab was so bad that the milk started leaking from the other end. He, the milk wouldn't even, right when he saw that Umar ibn Khattab, right away he knew that, khalas, this is the, I'm gonna die now. So he was brought to his house, and he was on his deathbed now. And as he's on his deathbed, Umar ibn Khattab, you know, he's right at that time, he's just about to die. Umar ibn Khattab's son takes this man, this great man, 
and he puts his head on top of his lap. And when he did that, he told his son, take my head and put it back to the ground. Why do you think he's doing that? He's trying to make himself realize the reality that now he's dead. So his son didn't do that. He said, you know, it's the same thing if I put it on. He literally said to him, Father, it's the same thing if I have it on my lap or, you know, how kids talk, even when Khattab is dying. Father, it's the same thing if I have it on my lap or I have it on the floor. So Umar Khattab said, put it on the floor as I've commanded you to do so. So when his son put that head on the floor, he started rubbing his head into the, set, into the dirt to remind himself of the dirt that he's going to be in. And we're all going to be in the same dirt. He's on a better dirt though, you know, in Medina. We hope to die in Medina as well. He's on a better dirt. He's right next to the Prophet ﷺ. You know, we hope to at least get to Al-Baqir. You know. And then, he told the people, and I'll leave you off with this, Umar al-Khattab at that point, he told the people, and this is Umar al-Khattab, imagine a lifetime of piety. Imagine the people in the higher committee being happy for the fact that you've accepted Islam. Imagine Ibn Mas'ud saying, because of the fact that he'd accepted Islam, we had felt victorious. Imagine every Sahabi thanking Umar that through the Islam of Umar, they were able to openly practice the rights of Islam. Imagine a person like this, and then he says, Wailu li Umar. Woe to Umar. Woe to the mother of Umar. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forgive me today. And people said to him, No, Umar, you're good. No. He goes, No. Waditu Allah kharajt minha kifafan la liya wala ali. He said, People said, No, you're the you're good, you're this, you're that. He said, I just wish one thing that I go out of this dunya, you know, while my scales just balance. Kifafan. There's nothing upon me as in no sins upon me because my good deeds at least weighed to balance Umar ibn Khattab, the second best from this nation after the Prophet I just wish that my scales balance. There's nothing upon me and there's nothing, nothing for me. You know, just that's my wish. I don't want anything more than that. With that being said, I'll let you go. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين